What do we want students to get out of math class? Proficiency, a love of math, job prospects? Hey everyone, this is Steph from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're passing things over to Kent Haynes. Kent is a Heinemann Fellow alum and middle school math educator based in Alabama. He's joined this week by Heinemann author Steve Leinwand. Steve is the author of Accessible Mathematics and Sensible Mathematics, and most recently the co-author of Invigorating High School Math. Kent and Steve discuss the current state of math instruction in the United States and some long overdue transformations that would benefit our students and teachers. As always, a transcript of this episode can be found at blog.heinemann.com. If you're a math educator and you've been around for a few years, you've likely heard of Steve Leinwand. And if you've ever seen him speak, you'll never forget him. Steve has been in the math education world for over 40 years, but he still speaks with the fire and conviction of someone who just can't wait to share the latest idea they've been chewing on. He's a principal research analyst at the American Institutes for Research, and he's written several books for Heinemann, including his most recent, Invigorating High School Mathematics, Practical Guidance for Long Overdue Transformation, co-authored with Eric Milo. He's worked as a math consultant for the Connecticut Department of Education, served on the board of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and was president of the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics. Just last year, NCTM presented him with their 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kent. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, by sheer coincidence, after we set up this interview, you came to my hometown of Birmingham, Alabama last month to speak at a conference focused on revitalizing Alabama's math education system. And since you've been around the country, you've met everybody, you've talked to everybody, you've spent so much time thinking about the big picture. I thought it would be fun to touch on some of those major areas of focus. Hopefully, Even though most people listening aren't secretary of education or state superintendent, we teachers and math coaches and principals can find some ways to align our practices in our classrooms and our schools with some of the vision that you have. So let's start with the core of my work personally, which is teaching. How do we help teachers become more effective in the day-to-day work of instruction? First and foremost, we break down the isolation within which almost every teacher I know works and operates. So few professions allow people to remain as isolated as education allows teachers to remain isolated. I first watched teacher collaboration way back in 1983 when I was blessed to be able to do site visits for a study of exemplary math programs with Mark Driscoll out of EDC. And um, I just came away from these incredible schools, um, one in, in Louisiana and one that I spent time on in at time with in um, uh, Maryland and another school in North Carolina. And in every case, there was a math department that collaborated, a math department that worked together. I watched teachers watch each other teach. I saw teacher faculty meetings that were amazing. I saw teachers who saw themselves as mentors to younger teachers. I watched teachers in each other's classes. And um, it's amazing that 37 years later, that's changed so little. We don't provide adequate coaching. We don't provide adequate support. We don't provide adequate time. We don't allow teachers to grow together. And I think that um, it's, it's, it's best to flip it around to the positive side. When, when we walk into, when I walk into some of the most powerful schools um, that, that I spend time on or time powerful schools that I spend time in, in every case, you have a case where people are collaborating, where people are working together. And, and I think that that's what's missing. You know, we, we, we operate in isolation and there's no way that when you are isolated in a business that is inherently social, that you can be as powerful as you need to be. We, we, we create moats around our classroom. I, I'm in schools where I'm told, oh, so we're really glad you're here. Um, just so you know, um, you are uh, really not supposed to go into, into, into room 220 and 274. 
Well, you know, I mean, I don't give a damn. I mean, those are the rooms where there are problems. Those are rooms where teachers don't want to be observed. Those are teachers who, in general, are hurting kids that everyone else in the, in the department has the following year. You know what I do. I write them down. And the first thing I do is I walk into room 220. And, and, and it's this, this embarrassing of, oh, I'm, and I'm not supposed to be here. I said, oh, is, are you teaching math? And the kids will go, yeah, this is math. And I go, good. And I just sit down. I mean, what are they going to do? Throw me out? <laughs> But, but seriously, I mean, you need to know what's going on in a school. And when people say, you can't come into my room, I don't want to be coached, you have a dysfunctional school. I certainly agree that this isolation is really inhibiting my development as a teacher because I have so few opportunities to hear from another adult who knows what they're talking about. Hey, I love how you did this. Did you notice that the kids kind of missed this element of the class? Or, oh, have you thought about structuring your warm up this way or what have you? Is this something that other countries have um, a, a better model for, a, a more effective? Absolutely. I mean, this goes back to some of the original work that was done with the TIMS, the Trends in International Math and Science Study, where we had videos of Japanese classrooms. And every one of those classrooms had five adults in the back of the room. You saw people learning from each other. That's the way it goes. Um, I um, have um, worked with people who who teach at the um, American Embassy School in India. A AEI is an amazing, um, amazing place. And the head of, um, of the largest school in New Delhi, 10,000 students, and there are about 400 parents in the building every day. There are always adults and parents in classrooms. I mean, number one, it just makes people more accountable. But more importantly, it's an incredible feedback mechanism. So yes, I, I, we are, along with Europe, pretty problematic when it comes to these uh, these issues of, of isolation. And let me just say that that so I'm doing work in um, in Cleveland, no, in Cincinnati, um, a bunch of years ago. And so I did one of these large sessions with um, 120 secondary math teachers. And, you know, you got people that are slouching around and they could, you know, care less. And so I went back to the table and I go, you know, is this really that bad? And they go, no, but I mean, please, we should be teaching our AP calculus class. And this is just getting in the way. And I said, yeah, you know what? I understand that. And so the next day I happened to be in that school and so I walked into that AP calculus class to sort of see. And um, the teacher says, oh, this is the guru that cost us yesterday. He's the guy that came and talked. And he says, you know, this is like a national math leader and we should be really honored he's in the classroom. And so I sat like I always do on the side of the room because I never sit in the back of a room. I'm always a, a co-participant, a co-teacher and a co-student in the, in the classroom. And you can only do that from the side of the room. And so he's doing his class and I um, jumped up and, and, and said, that's so really cool. I said, turn and tell your partner why that is. And you realized, and the teacher realized that, oh my God, I mean, I should have asked that question. That that, that bottom line is we co-taught the class for 45 minutes. And when it was over, he said, why don't you stay the whole rest of the day? This is the professional development that we didn't get yesterday that I would so value. It says it all. And so let's say, all right, we're waving our magic wand. You know, my school, every school in the country, we get that sort of common planning time and also the I guess the ha attitude among teachers that it's okay to come in my room, it's okay to give me feedback, positive, you know, negative, constructive feedback, I should say. What should we be talking about? What should we be Great. focusing on? I love this. I mean, Kent, you're asking all the right questions. It don't mean means I don't have to go back and interrupt and all that stuff. I think it is as simple as a 20 minute collegial discussion at the end of every observation. I mean, if I have been observing you, I have a responsibility to give you my thoughts. If you're being observed, you're sitting there going, well, what do you think? I mean, you know, can I grow from this experience? And so it starts with, I got to tell you, what really impressed me was it always starts positive because psychologically that makes sense, but it also sets the tone that there's always something that's positive. I want you to go search for it. I've done hundreds of these discussions afterwards, and sometimes it's hard to find something positive, but you can always find, I mean, something micro often. I got to tell you, the high point in this lesson was when Emma, is was that her name? And, and they'll go, yeah, I mean, the, the one sitting over in the side, side of the room. And I go, yeah, when, when Emma raised her hand and you handled that discussion and her confusion, I go, that's when I just said, you know, this 
teacher really gets it. Um, and every kid in the class benefited from that interchange. And I imagine you worry about spending too much time on it. I mean, that or the way that technology is used, you know, it was seamless and all. It, it always starts with something positive. And the second point is, so, you know, here are the questions I have. I mean, I wasn't sure about, or, you know, can you give me more information as to why you did this? Um, it, it's not critical. It's simply a matter of, so help me explain some of some of your actions. And then the discussion always ends with um, the observer saying, you know, on the basis of this discussion, on the basis of the observation, this is the one thing I'm going to try to do differently tomorrow. So it's action oriented. Um, those are the three things. I, you know, anyone can go to, to, to my website. Um, there are a whole bunch of slides that are there. My presentations are posted. There are probably, um, you know, 20 different presentations. And there, um, there is one about professional development. And, and the one about professional development says that it's not professional and it doesn't develop the way in which we are currently doing it. And then the alternatives are, among other things, these collegial visits. And it has a slide that sort of says, so at the end of the collegial visit, these are the three discussion questions for two professionals who have the same purpose, improving the mathematical lives of the same set of kids in this school. Well, go and collaborate. So that's where people can go for a visual copy of what I just gave orally. Fantastic. Now, something that I'm noticing a lot, and I think it's becoming particularly acute after the turnover with post-COVID, there's a lot of teachers leaving the profession. And so I see a lot of states working on alternative paths to certification, uh, eliminating requirements, eliminating, you know, content area tests. And I, I understand the rationale behind this because we need a sustainable amount of teachers in the profession. But I worry about teachers who don't necessarily have content area expertise being asked to teach in front of these students. So I, I'm curious your perspective on how important you think that subject area expertise is to, to know the mathematical ideas. And secondly, how good do you think we are? And I guess there's 50 different answers for 50 different states, but how good do you think we are at determining when a teacher truly does understand the math that they're teaching? So I had this discussion yesterday. I mean, one of the beauties of, you know, being 73 and of being quasi retired, but not really retired and being able to do whatever I want. Um, part of the way I give back is I'm just doing an immense amount of pro bono stuff, a whole bunch of mentoring. Um, you know, I get these emails and it's, can we talk? Can we, you know, get to pick your brain? And so um, one of the, 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 the really stellar math leaders in West Virginia, I mean, she's been doing some incredible things over the years. This is a kid that, that I met in an elevator 10 years ago. And I don't know whether I said something or she said something. And the next thing you knew, we were talking for 10 minutes. And then we've carried on a, a working relationship for um, for almost 10 years. And, and she was saying that the hardest thing they're facing in West Virginia, and I hear this across the country, is um, the warm body problem. We have to have a warm body in the classroom for all of the right custodial reasons. Um, but either they have serious content knowledge deficiencies or they have no idea what it means to teach math other than to just tell kids how to get answers. And so, you know, there is where this collaboration and more importantly, where the coaching and the mentoring is so important. So, so let's just go back. You know, we like to think rah, rah, America. America is so amazing and everything. I love this country. It's just this is a, a given. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But that doesn't mean that we've got all the answers. And, um, and, and we need to recognize that there are other places on this planet that are doing things a whole lot smarter than we are. So in Singapore, the reason why Shanghai and Beijing scores are so high is there is a very simple understanding that Teaching is like becoming a physician. You have teacher preparation like you have med school. Our daughter went from Princeton to Yale Med School to a residency at Duke. She could not even work in the um, VA hospital in New Haven when she was going to Yale Med School. Um, it, it just doesn't work. Everyone knows that you become a doctor during a three-year residency. Why is it that we think that somehow four years of education, one methods course, and a couple of weeks of student teaching, and you're going to be able to walk into the classroom? It's insane. So in Singapore, I mean, the very first year, all you are doing is you are observing. You are in classrooms. You are doing no teaching by yourself. You are co-teaching at most, just like a first-year resident. 
The second year in Singapore, you have your own class, but you are mentored the entire time. You have someone who is observing and someone who is helping you at every step of the way. You really are not teaching alone because there's somebody who is also responsible for those kids. It isn't until the third year that you are finally still with great supervision being able to teach. And the people who watch you the most as a third year teacher are the first year teachers who are seeing you in your classroom and watching as you struggle and you grow and all. And, and so I, I think that the way to handle the current situation is to stop and say, if you have to have a warm body and if there is a serious teacher shortage, the first order of business is you've got to pay people more money. It's, it's no different than than um, Walmart is now going to pay people 17 and 18 dollars an hour. The 15 isn't attracting people. I mean, you know, that's what the inflation is all about. We are finally paying people a living wage. Well, you know, we couldn't do a minimum wage, which would have done it. We were all screaming and yelling. that would have pe put people out of business. Well, now they're raising their prices. They're getting away with raising their prices. But, you know, they th th that that's the economic system working in all the right ways. The second thing is you've got to make people um feel like they're part of a profession. That's where back to the culture you're in. So people don't run because they're completely abused and bombarded and they have no life work balance. Um, you know, there are ways that we can support each other. We can have slides that are available. So I have to create those slides. I can adapt them. I can amend them. There are so many things that we can do to make things easier for teachers that all require collaboration. Um, and then we have to be able to um, provide that kind of induction and an internship, that, that opportunity for the first year teachers who come from all over the place to have the opportunity to grow and learn. And, and that is obviously um, the, the role of um, a teacher who's teaching four classes and then uh, or three classes and the other two fifths of the day, they are the mentor, the support person for the two new teachers. But that person really has not just a fake mentor, not just sort of someone to go and help, but somebody who is charged with, you know, them coming along. And, um, you know, when they don't make it, that failure is is sort of a collaborative failure. So, I mean, I, again, it, it requires us to, to be creative around um, things that we know work and things that we know make a difference. Let's, let's shift a bit and talk about assessment, uh, because I did something very scary. Uh, a few weeks ago, I sent you a couple of tests that my colleagues and I had given to our students, and you wrote back with a ton of excellent feedback about which questions you liked, which ones you thought I could do without, and what you thought was missing. So if you don't mind putting yourself back in that mindset, when you opened up my test for the first time, what were you looking for? Great. So let's put this in context. Um, we have to live with a whole bunch of tests. I think we live with too many tests. I think that, um, you know, the quality of the state assessments is mediocre in many cases. I think that when we lost the Park and Smarter Balance and all that came along with the Common Core, we lost a tremendous amount. The fact that it was $3 more per kid or even $7 more per kid for quality assessment and for open-ended items and for creative approaches to these things, we lost a tremendous amount. And so we've returned to multiple choice drivel that that just diminishes the quality of teaching that doesn't tell us nearly enough. So I have come to believe that first and foremost, every teacher needs to practice formative assessment. It is always asking questions. It's listening to kids and there is an exit ticket or an exit slip every single day, every single classroom. Now, having said that, it means that we both know that one out of five days, I don't need an exit ticket because the last task the kids did conveniently served as my exit ticket. I didn't realize that was going to happen, but I knew everything was going on and I knew the kids were successful and I didn't need to go any further so I could spend time on it. I also know that one out of every five classes, the class sucks. It didn't work. I blew it. There was an interruption and I don't do an exit ticket. So it's like it's part of my teacher evaluation says you used an exit slip. Well, yeah, but it really means that three days out of five. I've been in thousands and thousands of classrooms in the last 30 years. I don't believe I see an ass a formative assessment in more than 10% of the classrooms. We run out of time. It's not built in. We don't have a slide for it. Um, so we fail the fundamental test of how successful was your lesson, which means did the kids learn what you wanted to learn when we don't have that data? 
All the work that I do in New York at the Success Academy Charter Schools, which are the highest performing school network, school system in all of New York State, they outperform Scarsdale, they outperform Bronxville, they outperform Chappaqua. How is it possible that a school system that's 95% black and brown kids, right, mainly in Harlem and Bed-Stuy and, and the worst parts of the of the city in terms of, 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 of support and the public schools are doing so amazingly well? The answer is quality instruction. The answer is a formative assessment that they act on where it is a deliberate part of the day. So I start with that's instruction. That's not assessment, but it is assessment built into instruction. The second piece is I believe that the very best programs are driven by a set of high quality common unit assessments. It means that beginning in second grade, there are eight units and there are eight unit assessments. There are at best in the, in, the, in the best world, there are two forms, uh, a form for us to use and then a clone form that we use for a retest or a, or a makeup or for an opportunity to show that you didn't get it the first time, you can get it the second time within five or six days or something like that. Um, but these unit assessments are done collaboratively. They answer the question, we are successful as a unit grade level team, as a course team when our students do well on this unit assessment. And when they don't, we, knew we, we know we need to build in some reteaching before we get to the final. It's really common sense. It's again, why less is more. We have to have time for the reteaching. We have to know what our focus is. And so um, I just think that a unit assessment is a place that not just answers the question, were we successful? Did the students learn what we know? But it's my fundamental planning guide. You know, I, I start every the week before the unit. I come together as a as a math department or as a grade level team, and the issue is all right, fine. Next fractions is next. No linear functions is next. Okay, fine. Let's talk about it. What are the pr hardest parts of it? What are the what are the parts that drive you crazy? Where do you need more time? How did we do it? You know, better last year. How do we build off of that? And what is it we're looking for? In other words, let's all look at that unit assessment. Is it still appropriate? Does it still work? And so when I look at your assessments, like I have looked at literally thousands of, of, of assessments of that sort, um, the first question is, is it balanced? That is, does it ask for the core basic skills that are non-negotiable for that unit and for any future further learning of mathematics. Two, does it get at conceptual understanding? Does it, in other words, move from depth of knowledge one, the core, the recall, the vocabulary, the understanding that is enabling? And then does it ask do I have evidence that students understand the key concepts, that they are not falling into the misconceptions? And then thirdly, do I have um, knowledge that they are able to do some reasoning and solve some interesting kinds of problems? And, and so, I mean, that to me is um, an assessment that also differentiates. Um, you know, this idea of differentiation says we need to build in some of the enrichment. It, it says that that um, differentiation to me, great teaching is, and we'll talk about this perhaps under instructional quality, but to me, differentiated instruction says we ask kids, why? How do you know? Can you explain? How did you picture that? Um, who did it differently? That's Those are those key guiding questions. Um, our assessments need to say, show another way. Do it in two ways. Our assessments need to say, show it symbolically and show it graphically, and we don't care what order you do it in. So um, what I look for in your assessments was, does it go beyond just a procedure and an answer? And so my feedback to you was saying, um, you know, the, the skill stuff was all there. I think you could have reordered it. You want to put that stuff up front so that you have it and it's clear. And, um, you know, the kids in sense get some cues about what they need to know in that first part. And then, um, you know, I was surprised that, um, like in many cases, you didn't ask kids why. How do you know? You didn't expect them to show their work, um, you know, in any real way. So those are the things. And, and I think that you saw my comment that, yeah, but you only had one application of any of this. So you didn't help kids understand why is any of this stuff important? When would you see it in the real world? So that's the lens that I use. And, and I believe that 10 items, some with uh, multiple parts, is all you need. 
And I'm still screaming and yelling at, at my friends at Success Academy, where I have invested a lot of my time and energy over the last five years to release all of that stuff. And they're hung up on some copyright issues and they're hung up on other things. But I mean, I just would love to have the ability to say, hey, there's this website to show you a set of really impressive unit assessments. I really appreciate that. And I think that it's really, um, really interesting to think about this because we actually, as a department, or at least the seventh grade department, sort of wrote these together, right? So it's a collaboration among colleagues. And there's obviously, uh, you know, attention where we want this to be an assessment that everybody feels comfortable assigning that sort of thing. And so a common response that I hear from my colleagues and feel frankly myself is we have to put a grade from zero to 100 in for the assignments that we have at our school. That's not a, that's not negotiable with our district, right? And so if I have a test with 10 questions, my my students are like, oh, I missed one question. Now I'm down to a 90. I missed another question. I'm down to an 80. I missed it. How, how do you respond to that uh, that idea? Why is everything worth the same amount? I mean, there are some things you get wrong that are only worth a point. That's all. It's not a big deal. OK, I can reteach you. You didn't remember it. Why am I going to zap you for something you didn't remember? Right. A serious conceptual error. Yeah. I mean, you know what? There's there's a problem there. But I respond to that first and foremost by saying we ought to have a system of retesting. Every single kid ought to have an opportunity to go over that test, to figure out what they didn't know, what they couldn't do, and have a chance within the next five days to come back and retake the test. That's how I deal with it first. That's just fairness. That's just common sense to me. This idea of one shot, you know, so I'm working in the highest performing high school at all of New Jersey a couple of years ago. Well, how come you only have this one shot? These kids are like so pressured in all those ways. And I said, all you do is contribute to that. Well, what do you think? We should give every kid a trophy? I mean, that's the kind of mindset that I run into. You can hear a person who's a good teacher, who cares, thinking about, well, I'm just sort of making it too easy, right? Another says, where else in the world do you get second chances? I'm sorry. I said, you said that? I said, where else in the world do you not get a second chance? We live in a society where you can kill someone and get a second chance. I mean, what, you know, you can sin, you get another chance. I mean, we live in a world of atonement and a, and a world where, I mean, how can you even call yourself, and I have no religiosity in my body at all, but how can you call yourself a religious or spiritual person? How can you go to church every Sunday or to temple or to a mosque and not recognize that there's more to life than just retribution? So anyway, um, I, I think that there are lots of ways to respond to that, and they require us to say, we're going to do it differently, that we are about serving our kids and we lose nothing. And the kids lose nothing. Everybody gains by having um, a, a second shot at it. And, and then the whole point structure is really key. I mean, you know, I think that we ought to have um, a, a point system, that, that it's not 10% for everything. But you know what? Here is a 40-point test. And we have marks. So we have points. It's so clear. This is one point. This is one point. This is two points. This is four points. This is five points with partial credit and all those kinds of things. And then we simply convert the points. Gee, we're math people. To, to a number that we need. So, I mean, I can live with the 100 system. Um, I also think that we'd be a whole lot better off if we all thought about, um, look, there is A work and some work a little better and work that's a little worse. Good. Uh, there is B work. There's work a little better, but it's not A level, and there's work a little worse. In other words, it makes sense to me to talk about that we have, you know, 95, 98, 92. We have 85. That's B work. OK. And, and then, I mean, you're going to tell me that there's a difference between one student's 89. And I'm uh, sorry, let's be fairer. One student gets a 79 by making lots and lots of careless errors and loses all those points, but hits it out of the park on the two biggest, most important consolidating items. Meanwhile, the student sitting next to that person gets the 81. They hit it out of the park on all the mindless, all this stuff. They can get all the skills. They regurgitate beautifully, but they really cannot come at, to it. And on the big items, they get low partial credit. And we sit there and say, well, I mean, 81 is better than that. No, I mean, we've got to find a way to be able to have our point structures so that um, we're, we're not differentiating between 79 and 81. We're differentiating between a B minus and a C plus. And, and so I, I think that we'd be a whole lot better. And then I don't have any ideas about failure in Ds. I know that, you know, basically we have a system that has, you know, a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, plus and minus, C, plus and minus, and then you fail. I mean, you know, a D, a D is, what is a D? A D is failure. So we have, to, we have a lot to think about with that whole system. Um, I do think that the British system with the marks 
or the points um, makes a lot of sense. Um, and that way, we don't worry about the points. We sit there as a com department and say, so, you know, hey, look, all I can tell you is that these two items are really a quarter of what I'm gaining for. Good. So, you know what? I have a 50 point test. So, this one is. Um, this one is um, six points. This one is seven or eight points, and then we go from there. And we ended up at you know at fifty points, and, and it's and it's weighted in a sensible way. That's interesting. I I had a system that I used uh, for several years here. Um, I didn't implement it this year because it's my first back back at this school, and it takes a lot of work, as you'll hear. But I did a standard space grading system where I would break out. Okay, well, the, unit three has essentially six major ideas. And so I would have a line at the top of the test and it says, I can, and basically the, you know, each, each of the six major ideas are standards. And then I would give them a test and then I would grade it item by item, but then I would just go back and holistically say, do I feel that this student has mastered this standard and sort of treat it a little bit more, I wouldn't say arbitrarily, but more holistically, just trying to say, do I think that this student understands and can apply the Pythagorean theorem, let's say. And so I could actually give the same test that I've been giving, you know, the, or the types of tests that I sent you or what have you. I just assessed it in a different way. And then the benefit that I found from that is, you know, my students knew where they needed to study for the reassessment. And then we could just reassess that item as opposed to, oh, I have to retake the unit three test. You know, like I have a daughter in preschool and, and I get a very thorough standards-based grading report from her teacher that says, oh, she can you know, identify letters, she can, you know, count, you know, order the numbers. If, if, you know, if my daughter's teacher said, oh, she's, you know, she has a B in <laughs> letter recognition or, or a B in uh, English or whatever, I'd be like, I don't know what that means, you know? And so I really enjoy the standards-based system, which I, I, my child's elementary schools uses it. It just isn't very popular in middle and high school, unfortunately. So I think that we have some real problems and confusions with the term standards-based. Um, part of it is the teachers are saying, what are you talking about? All my tests have been standards-based. Every one of my items is linked to a standard. So it's standards-based. Um, you know, so now what do you want me to do with that stuff? I mean, so it's it, the language is confusing and it doesn't motivate me to change. Um, I think that, that we ought to talk about less standards-based and more balanced, common, collectively reviewed great task system of unit assessments. And, and and so we look at it from the perspective, as we said, of balance and, and, you know, we do it together and we review it and we look at the student work and, you know, one person is a day ahead of everyone else. And so we can make some minor adjustments on the test, you know, so quickly, but it is a set of items that are aligned with a set of standards. And then there is the opportunity to say, OK, so in terms of the, the basic skills and the vocabulary, very strong. You, you did well on items one, two and three. That's standards based. That's giving you feedback like your three year old gets. Right. In terms of the conceptual understanding, there, there are some issues here. You were not able to explain. Right. You were not able to show how these things relate. So I think that we can accomplish what ideally standards based is about when we construct our tests with deliberate attention to what we're measuring. I think it's interesting. I guess what you're saying is if we're trying to leverage and have the most impact possible, getting teachers to collaborate on the same type of test that's within their comfort zone is going to lead to a larger impact than trying to re rejuvenate the entire system of assigning grades. When I walk into an Algebra 2 class in a school in any state in this country, and within four minutes, it is obvious that Half the kids were using a graphing calculator in Algebra 1, and half the kids weren't. I want to run. I, I just think that that's malpractice. I think we have to have a common set of expectations for everyone who's taking Algebra 1, for everyone who's taking Geometry. No, for everyone who's taking fourth grade math. I know that in fourth grade, I have a teacher who loves reading, who I want my own kid to be in that class. I'm really to screw math for that year because that person is so magical with reading and writing and, and all the, you know, their, their shelf is filled with the best Heinemann products. It's so awesome. But that person needs to be assessing with the same way that the two other fourth grade teachers are assessing. Um, we, we've got to have that kind of commonality. I just don't think that it's it's fair to the kids to sort of have sort of different standards as we roll across the, the, the grades. So 
we've talked a little bit about how to help teachers improve their instruction by collaborating. We've talked about how to help teachers improve their assessment. And I really like those because those are things that I have a handle on, uh, things that I have at least the possibility of having an impact on. It, it definitely requires a bigger shift than any teacher is capable of implementing personally, but it could be very interesting. Uh, so let's just start quickly. What, what do you think is wrong with high school mathematics in America? High school math teachers have not been given anywhere close to the level of useful guidance as K-8 teachers have been given. Um, when I look back on my 50 years, I can tell you that I am proudest of the fact that there have been some real successes. We've won the gender issue in so many ways. 20 years ago and 40 years ago, math was a male um, domain. It is no longer a male domain. It is um, incredible the changes that we've seen. Um, what I've seen at K-8 in the last 40 years is just an unbelievable shift from worksheets and computation and little more than that done in 30 minutes a day to really teaching mathematics and engaging kids. And the same thing applies to the technology. The use of technology and, and its ubiquitousness, and even when it's used poorly, it's still, it's still there. But I see a lot of incredibly good use of technology. I see interactive whiteboards being used in ways that are clearly supporting um, learning in so many ways across all disciplines. Um, I, I only tell you that because um, when I look at where I failed, when I look at where there's been no change, um, we still track and group in ways that are just nefarious. Um, we screw more kids by telling them, you can't do it. You don't have a math brain. You don't have a math gene. You can't do it. Um, and all too often, those are kids of color or kids of lower economic class. And it is just disgusting and pathetic, the way in which the system systematically preserves privilege at the detriment of the entire society. And high school sits there still with an 1894 committee of 10 model of algebra and geometry, that it is about getting kids ready for calculus today. And, um, and, and, and when you look at guidance, NCTM has never really provided anything close to what the Common Core did for K-8. And the Common Core itself ran out of time. So where high school starts, it is a systematic sorting of kids out with overwhelmingly obsolete stuff, poorly organized, and um, a total outlier in the world. And so I just think that when you look at, at Eric and, and my book, we sit there and say, so it used to be K-6 was common, and then you differentiate in some ways. And then it became K-8 that's common. Well, we think that the world is such that K-10 has to be common that we need to continue the integrated math of 6th, 7th, and 8th into ninth and 10th. Ninth grade is part algebra, part geometry, and part statistics. That we have to do statistics like we do in 7th grade and 8th grade and continue it in ninth grade. That the idea of a common curriculum for all kids, and I think without levels and without all kinds of tracking and, and all that that entails, um, is the right way to push the quality of common, appropriate, important math for citizenship and for the workplace through the end of 10th grade. That means that Algebra 1 that is currently in 8th grade, thanks to the Common Core, continues. It's important, but it means that Algebra 1 has to change, and it hasn't. I mean, if it's taught right in 8th grade, then we review it, and we build on, and we expand it in ninth grade. The idea of this Algebra 1 with quadratics and simple manipulation with, a, with, a, with a, an Algebra 2 course that every teacher says is a nightmare to teach unless you just love telling kids how to do something without thinking or reasoning or a applying it, um, you know, that's 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 algebra two. And then you talk to the calculus teachers who say, I don't know why they're doing synthetic division. I don't expect kids to do that, even when they're doing Newton's quotient in calculus. So, so we've got a screwed up obsolete curriculum that has to change. And this linchpin is twofold. Algebra two and everyone going to calculus is simply misguided. And the lack of attention to statistics as co-equal to algebra and geometry is a societal um, nightmare. We're the only country in the world that does this stale geometry sandwich between two rotten pieces of, um, of, of algebra. And then you sit there and say, but wait a second, everyone leaves fifth grade, everyone goes to sixth grade. Everyone leaves eighth grade, everyone goes to ninth grade. Everyone graduates from high school, well, no. 
we're only at 90%, which is amazing that we've gotten that high. I mean, in the last 10 years, that's been the biggest change in all of education is that we've moved from 75 to almost 90% high school graduation rates. But when you graduate, or even if you're part of the 10 or 15% that don't, you go to community college, you go to a high school, you go to a, 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 um, a selective school, you are a math major, you're a physics, you're a STEM person, you are going into medicine, you're going into nursing, you're going to be a construction person, you're going to a community college, you're going into the job force, you're going into the military. My goodness, it's all over the place. And so we ought to be able to say somewhere around February, March, April of sophomore year. So here are the um, pathways. Most importantly now is colleges increasingly have got a calculus pathway, a quantitative literacy pathway, and a statistics pathway. The math departments have been pilloried at, the, at, at so many of the major state institutions because all they have is calculus and half of the departments say, we don't need calculus, we need statistics. And so you have this move towards um, pathways there, high schools out of step. So, so that there's just a mismatch that has wonderful things going on in K-8 and some really cool things going on in college. And high school sits there as this block, as this barrier, still believing that the answer is calculus. The answer for about 25 to 35 percent of the kids is calculus. But we don't need pre-calculus and calculus. We could easily have this common curriculum and then 11th and 12th grade, there is a pathway that is an intermediate algebra pre-calculus. It is really intermediate algebra. It takes the best of what's currently in algebra two and it adds some of the stuff from pre-calculus. And then lo and behold, the kids are ready. There are dozens of school systems in the United States that do not put kids into eighth grade algebra one solely so that they can take calculus. I need every kid to be able to take calculus. If you blossom and it comes alive in ninth grade and 10th grade, great. All of a sudden you want to go do STEM stuff. I love it. We have this intensive calculator, computer-based um, course. It doesn't do a lot of statistics, but it is about functions and polynomials and about a range of functions and gets you to, to ready to do calculus. It is not all that different than the IB system and program of two years that includes calculus. It also includes statistics, but it can and must be done for some percentage of the kids. Well, then you've got you know somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the kids who, wh what are they doing now? And so what we propose in the book and what, you know, states like Oregon and Ohio and others are, are really pushing towards um, is this notion of a um, statistical pathway that, that is um, data work and statistics work and allows kids to take the AP stat course if they, you know, AP stat course and test if they want as, as seniors and a quantitative literacy, financial literacy test. I mean, why is it that we don't allow every kid to understand, you know, after a week of exploration and spreadsheet work that when you pay the minimum balance on your MasterCard, you are screwed? Why do we not have kids understanding that when you don't pay the speeding ticket and you just ignore it because, you know, you just think you can ignore it. It's like the, um, the ticket on the windshield for the parking fine. Well, yeah, but when you look at what happens to that accelerated um, fine, it is incredibly discriminatory. You know, I mean, fine. You know what? I end up having to pay five hundred dollars. I can afford that. You've got people who don't have five hundred dollars to go spend on that if they don't spend they don't and they don't even have a hundred dollars to pay the damn thing in the first place. So I mean, we've got to be able to have people understand the ways in which exponential change works and the way in which it plays out in our society. And and so you've got the um, data center quantitative literacy materials that could easily be adapted. You've got some of the data science materials. Some of it comes from U cubed at Stanford, and some of it comes from UCLA. The point is that those materials are out. Out there, they are free. They are online, and um, it's uh, it's it's to me the only way that we can um, invigorate high school math, which means that it's no longer deadly, which means that it's no longer oh god, this sucks, but it's actually engaging. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I hope everybody can hear what I was talking about that fire and conviction. And what I really appreciate about this is in all these areas we discussed today. You're not just focused on identifying the problem, but you're giving us ideas for a solution so that even if we don't necessarily implement exactly what you're talking about, it gives us, it's much easier for me to think about how to improve something if I have a, 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 a framework to look at. And so I, I really appreciate that. And I should mention, if anybody is 
particularly interested in Steve's work on high school mathematics. We do have uh, another great conversation with Steve and his co-author, Eric, in our podcast archive. So everybody should check that out. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. I just want to, oh, if, yes. if we've got three seconds, Please. I just want to say that, that, I mean, obviously there is a soft spot in my heart for Heinemann. It's been, you know, a wonderful relationship, but of all the books that I've written and, and the one that I understand second only to Tom Carpenter's children's mathematical thinking, um, the accessible math is the book that I turn to first, because before we even talk about curriculum, what happens when you close your classroom door? And I think that, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on instruction, instructional quality day, which is perfectly fine. We can't do it all in, in, in an hour. But, um, you know, the first thing you ask me is, what do I look for in a, in a test? The real question is, what is it that every coach, every principal, every parent who visits a school and every support consultant needs to look for in a classroom is how do you get the kind of engagement and the kind of thinking that is just so critical and that is not um, is nowhere close to uniform. In fact, the, the variation in instructional quality within schools, between schools, continues to be gigantic. And I mean, particularly in math, we, we you can't get away with that in reading to the same way that you can get away with it in, in math. And then I believe it's even worse in science, but you know, that's a, a whole ne another, another discussion. Um, and, and so it's not like I'm selling my book. I'm just reminding people that um, the, the real solution, the way in which we prepare kids for all these things is we're doing cumulative review. We're asking kids why we are using context. We're doing the kinds of things that um, we know research tells us make a difference. And so I just, you know, an unabashed, shameless plug <laughs> for uh, a book that's still out there called Accessible Math. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. My pleasure. Thank you, Kent. This was just a great discussion. Our thanks to Kent and Steve for their time today. Kent can be found on Twitter at Kent Haynes and at gamesforyoungminds.com. You can learn more about Steve and his work on Twitter at Steve underscore Linewand and at stevelinewand.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening. Copyright Heinemann Publishing.